Welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. I'm Simon Butler. And I'm Mel Barnes. On this show, we'll be speaking with newly elected Socialist Councillor in Melbourne, Sue Bolton. And we'll hear from Lindsay Hawkins about how a group of progressive union activists have won control of the New South Wales Public Service Association. And later, we'll also hear from Carla Sands. But first, let's have some activist news. As we film this, over 300 asylum seekers on Nauru have entered the fifth day of a hunger strike, with some strikers collapsing and being given medical treatment. They're calling on the Australian government to hear their claims in Australia and close the Nauru Detention Centre. In this exclusive interview with Greenleft TV, conducted on November the 1st, a refugee on Nauru speaks about the terrible living conditions inside the camp. 300 asylum seekers have taken part in the hunger strike. They will continue the hunger strike for an unlimited time. We are not happy here and the condition of life is not even the poor, we're basic for living. All the asylum speakers want to go back to Australia. We just request to the Australian government to open our processing. We are still living in tents. It is raining here, so the tents are leaking. Day by day, they are just uh, suffering from many, many diseases. The two of the asylum seekers, they suffer from blood vomiting. and we'll be around to make sure they are held, they are held to account. We request to the people of Australia, we have left our homeland in hope of a new start. Right now we are in a situation of stress. We request Australian people to help us and to take us back to Australia. Julia Gillard, shame on you! Not Minnesota, not the... 200 cleaners demonstrated outside Sydney's town hall on October 31 as part of the Clean Start campaign that demands an increase to the $17 hour wage they earn. This is the little people really taking uh, the big end of town on. What do we want? Clean Start! When do we want it? Now! The Property Congress is on inside the town hall and the cleaners are out the front. Their session going on right at the moment is the view from the top. I mean, how arrogant is that? We're giving the view from the bottom. When do we want it? For a cleaner to work really hard doing pretty horrible work and earning $17. The largest Reclaim the Night rally in 15 years was held in Fremantle on October 26. The annual march calls for an end to violence against women, including refugee women who are incarcerated in detention centres around Australia. Let's demand an end to the system that treats our bodies as commodities. We are here tonight to raise our voices and declare on behalf of those women whose voices cannot be heard over their prison fences that the policy of mandatory detention is a form of violence. Take a stand, take back the night. Take back the night. We don't have the fear of rape. A woman's body is not something that exists as purely sexual. responsible for the exploitation, humiliation and degradation that women experience every single day. Socialist and activist Sue Bolton won a seat in the North Melbourne Council of Moreland in elections that were held on October 27. She joined Sam Wainwright in Fremantle as the second Socialist Alliance councillor and has vowed to be an activist on the council. Greenleft TV spoke to Sue Bolton and asked her how she plans to use her position to boost community campaigns. Well, congratulations, Sue. Uh, so the victory for the Socialist Alliance in the Moreland City Council, what does it mean? It shows that people can be attracted towards socialist ideas and people more broadly than just the left are prepared to support a socialist platform in, in elections. And of course, 
they want to see what socialists can do if people are actually elected. People were attracted to some of our slogans which related to very important issues in the Moreland area and one of those was community need not developer greed and that's partly because the developers have been running amok in the Moreland area. For instance, while there are meant to be height limits in the Moreland area on new developments, the developers have been allowed to get away with flexible implementation of those height limits and that has really angered a lot of residents. Also we took up issues like cost of living pressures on people and the fact that councils need to try and develop a, an approach with issues like council rates which are very inequitous form of funding of local government because it means that someone who's really rich and someone who might be living on a pension or new start allowance who might have bought a house years ago, they pay the same amount of rates when clearly one can afford to pay a much higher level of rates than the other. And so you're having ordinary working class people, pensioners, people on unemployment benefits pushed out of areas that they've you know, established themselves in. So that's, that's an important issue. On the, the makeup of the council, we'll have two Greens five or six Labor Party, one DLP and now a Liberal Party person for the first time. How do you see your approach as a socialist as say compared to others who've been elected? Well we're going to organise a meeting of both members of Socialist Alliance plus people who supported the campaign to work out a plan of campaigns that we want to initiate or be involved in supporting. And, and work out a bit of a plan, a priority list of issues that we want to raise at council. The only way in which this position as a socialist on council is going to be able to be used is if we have a very active approach. We can really only win on issues if we have strong community campaigns. So I see my role on council as being the per a person who both helps build campaigns that might already be existing or, or that people are wanting to initiate but also to help instigate campaigns which may be defensive campaigns like against attempts to cut or close down services or else to actually try and initiate uh, campaigns for new things in, in the local area. And I think that's a very important issue because in politics, whether it's at a local council level or to state or federal level, there are all sorts of forces lined up against any kind of progressive politics or progressive change. And even if, for instance, the majority of councillors agreed with us on a particular issue, then you have all sorts of business interests behind the scenes trying to manipulate the situation. At a local council level, that's often developers. Usually when there are any limits put on development, developers talk about how this is all just red tape, green tape, just bureaucracy, uh, as opposed to the fact that, you know, residents want to have some sort of controls, some sort of say over how the urban development is built, is built up. So we will need to build active campaigns. And in some ways, I actually, while this is an example that seems very far removed from what we're talking about, in some ways I see that as being a little bit parallel to the process that's happening in Venezuela, where you've got um, a government bureaucracy, bureaucracy which has tried to block every single progressive reform of the Chavez government, and so the only way in which the Chavez government has been able to advance progressive reforms has been to basically say to the people, do you want this? We have to go out and organise parallel structures to implement free education and all sorts of other things. And in a sense, that's what we have to do, whether it be socialists on a local council or in a state or, or federal um, government. Um, that's the sort of thing we would have to do if we were in a position of having a majority. Socialism, anti-capitalist struggle, all of that can only come about through people taking the reins themselves, people taking self-organising and the more self-organising that happens the better and that's what I need to encourage but the challenge is up to us now, Socialist Alliance members and our supporters to try and put this into practice.
Last month, the New South Wales Public Service Association held union elections, with a ticket of progressive union activists challenging the Labor incumbents. The progressives won the top position and control of the 45-member Central Council. We spoke with one of the elected members of the Central Council, Lindsay Hawkins, and asked him why they decided to challenge the old union leadership and what issues they campaigned for. I joined my union five years ago and uh, became elected as a delegate and pretty quickly I found myself on the outer. I found a union that was weighted down by bureaucracy and a conservative attitude that was dominated by Labor Party politics. Within the PSA for a long time, power has been concentrated in the hands of a few leadership uh, officials in the executive who uh, were mostly interested in uh, feathering their own nests and pursuing their uh, career interests at the expense of the membership. The top executive officials were paying themselves huge, huge salaries. The top three paid officials had never worked as public servants, the career union officials. Within the PSA, for a long time, there's been a rank and file group of members and delegates, the progressive PSA, who has been working hard to uh, hold the union officials to account and to fight for a strong union that vigorously represents the interests of the membership. I became a supporter of the progressive PSA and became actively involved in uh, working with uh, my fellow delegates to challenge the incumbent union leadership in elections. The platform that the progressive PSA ran on was to devolve power to delegates and to members at the grassroots level in order to strengthen the union and to pursue uh, an industrial strategy to combat the Afaro government's attacks on the public service. We've campaigned on a basis of cutting the huge salaries of the top elected officials and to be able to um, make transparent how the union functions for a long time. Decision making within the PSA has largely been conducted in secret without uh, information coming to members and without delegates being able to participate. We also asked Hawkins about what role the union can play in opposing New South Wales Premier Barry O'Farrell's attacks on workers and why it's important for left activists to be involved in challenging bureaucratic union leaderships. Our main task right now will be to um, do as much as we can to prevent heavy job losses and to hold on to the conditions that are now being stripped back by the government. But in order to do that, we need to completely rebuild the way that the union functions because uh, for a long time the union has been very weak and has failed to utilise the strength of the union, the membership. So that means that we will need to focus on rebuilding delegate structures within the union and putting power in the hands of rank and file members and delegates to, to be able to take effective action to combat O'Farrell's attacks on our uh, working conditions. I think it's absolutely vital that unions um, form links with um, community groups and broader society in general to pursue a, um, a program of social change that cuts across uh, divisions of uh, workplace, uh, gender, occupation, sexuality, etc. <clears throat> and unite workers as a class. So to that extent, uh, one union that is effective in mobilising its members can only achieve so much, but a whole union movement that is dedicated towards mobilising members to take mass action, I think can change the whole of society for the better. And even more so when a union movement works in conjunction with other progressive social currents in society that can hopefully one day bring about the kind of uh, radical social change that can bring about working class liberation. And now for some more activist news. About 40 refugee activists blockaded Maribyrnong Detention Centre in Melbourne on October 31 to prevent the deportation of a Tamil man back to Sri Lanka where he would have been at serious risk of harm. That day, a court injunction was put in place that prevents the man from being deported until after a court case in early January. Let the refugees in! Don't deport to danger! Free, free the refugees! We are determined to struggle to stop 
the deportation of refugees to danger. Refugees are welcome! Racists are not! And it's important that we keep standing up and it doesn't matter the fact that the Australian government has passed these unjust laws. No deportation! Unjust laws need to be broken. A rally in March at Sydney University on October 31 was held to protest moves by the university administration to close the Koori Centre. In response, the university promised to return the support staff to the Koori Centre and ensure the Koori Students' Common Room remains open. Shut it down! No way out of Koori Centre! Here to stay! Shut it down! No way! Koori Centre! Here to stay! Shut it down! No way! I'm a business student. I'm studying Bachelor of Primary Education. Um, and I rely heavily on the Koori Centre, which is why we're here today. The support network at the Koori Centre has been put under threat and we're here to protest about it because without the support of the Koori Centre, I don't know how long I may be here or how long a lot of the other Indigenous students may be here or future Indigenous students, how successful they will be without the support of the Koori Centre. A former Israeli paratrooper, Abner Gabarahu, now an activist with Breaking the Silence, visited Australia recently to promote the new book called Our Harsh Logic. He told Green Left TV's Peter Boyle how 850 former Israeli soldiers had given testimony about the gross injustices against Palestinians that they've witnessed as part of Israel's military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Eventually, after finishing their three years of service with questions, with thoughts, with discussions, they decided to put together an exhibition of pictures, of photos, of testimonies, very spontaneous, very not sophisticated, or very low-tech and they thought this could start some sort of debate inside the Israeli society. Now this debate actually was much wider than they expected and thousands of people came to this very simple exhibition. But maybe the most important thing that happened is that people from different units, different places, different times came out and said, we can tell you the exact same story. They realized this isn't the specific story of a specific unit, but the story of a generation. And now let's hear from Carlo Sands. G'day, I'm Carlo Sands. This is my corner. So I guess if the government's proposed bill to excise the entire Australian mainland from the migration zone is passed, we're all going to be un-Australian. And that will be one insult politicians use to describe anything they don't like that's going to lose a little bit of its force. Because really, forget Aboriginal people protesting on Australia Day. It's pretty hard to get more un-Australian than declaring the entirety of Australia un-Australia. Of course, it's not actually going to be abolished for all people everywhere. Australia is only going to be abolished for those who come by boats. If you, for example, fly in, you're going to find Australia right where it has always been. And should, while here, you decide to seek asylum, perhaps, I don't know, you flew in on version, you can't stand the thought of the flight back, you will enjoy all of those special privileges that come with things such as the Refugee Convention, you know, little perks like access to courts. But you come by a vote and Australia magically disappears. This is sort of like an invisible, special invisible force field to keep out poor people who can't afford plane tickets. And why not? I mean, let's face it. There's surely no sign that you're just a, some sort of rotter trying to take advantage of our famously generous immigration refugee scheme than spending your entire life savings to put your family on a boat to risk their lives, risk their lives on a treacherous sea journey. Really, if you're not even willing to put up with airline food, how do you expect us to take your tales of woe seriously? Immigration Minister Chris Bowen justified his total back down from 2006 when he described more or less the same policy being pushed by John Howard as, and I quote, hypocritical and illogical, and said it would be a stain on our national character. He justified this by claiming removing Australia from Australia would save lives. I mean, really, here I was thinking this bastard was just some sort of cynical opportunist 
willing to, without a principle to save his life, willing to say or do anything, even try and outflank Tony Abbott from the right in a desperate bid to hold on to power at all costs. Turns out he's just a great humanitarian who's willing to implement a policy to make it easier to send desperate people to isolated prison camps in conditions that are currently causing a spate of suicide attempts because he wants to save lives. Of course, there is some parliamentary opposition. The disgraced former Labour MP turned independent, Craig Thompson, has joined with the Greens in insisting he will not vote for a bill he describes as disgusting. He might be a poster boy for corruption, facing allegations of spending thousands of dollars of union members' money illegally on prostitutes, but Craig Thompson shows more respect for other human beings than the entire rest of the Labour caucus that does everything it can to put as much distance as they can be between him and them in an apparent bid to show they have some principles. I, I don't pretend to understand politics in this country. I'm Carlos Sands. And that was my corner. Thanks, Carlo. That's all from this Green Left Report. Our next show will be a special forum filmed in front of a studio audience with special guests, New South Wales Green MP John Kay, human rights lawyer and activist Kelly Tranter, and Socialist Alliance national convener Susan Price. If you'd like to be part of the Sydney audience for that show, check our Facebook page for more details. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mighty fall, a time was spent with backs against the wall. The gift of life is no gift after all, and so for this the struggle must continue. The resistance will survive alive with a definite function, not for those with a definite.